welcome. Uh, we'll make a start. Uh, piece of paper on the outline. It's it's some um, sections of Genesis chapter six from the early part of the Bible, and um, Genesis chapter eight. We're touching on the story of the flood. Um, yeah, kind of great shocking story. I'm going to read just that first little section out, um, and we'll dig into it. Um, welcome, sir. We'll cover our former standard format of. I'm going to read this out, speak for about 20 minutes, uh, then open it up for questions and comments and reflections and interaction. So, uh, starting at the start there. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Sham, Ham, and Jepheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. So the question I'd uh, like us to explore, this kind of passage, uh, the story of the flood, where uh, God um, floods the world and all humanity in it is pretty shocking. Uh, but I think to help us kind of understand it, give us a framework, I wanted to ask a question to step back into the, the kind of strength of what's happening here. See, what would you do if you had the power to end evil? There's evil occurring in the world at the moment. Uh, what would you do if you had the power to end evil? Would you wield it? Even if it meant perhaps the death of people that were bringing about the evil. And, and, and when would you wield it? Would you wield it immediately, straight away? Or would you give them a warning? And if you gave them a warning, how long would you give them before you brought the end of evil about? And what happens in that warning period if they could still go on doing evil to other people? So what, what would you do if you had the power to end evil? See, it's easy to maybe look at the account of the Bible and the fact that God sometimes acts to end evil why does he do that? It seems so awful. But if evil's real and it's true, wouldn't we want it to end? What, what would you do? When, when would you do something? Would you just stand aloof from it and not worry about it? It doesn't matter that people are being harmed and difficulties happening. Well, the world in, in Genesis chapter 6 here is um, described as a place of profound evil. And the world's a disaster because of the human heart. It's shocking for us to hear um, but that's the context of what we're going on. So if you were in that context, what, what would you do if you were faced with such evil? So what's the scale of the disaster here? Well, it hints initially at a cosmic rebellion. Look there in sentence two on that page printed out for you. It says, man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. Then the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive. And you, you get it down there uh, in sentence four, the sons of God came to the daughters of man. Um, it seems like that some kind of, the sons of God are, are probably some spiritual being, angelic beings or something. You get that picked up also in the book of Job at the start, uh, where Satan is described as one of the sons of God. So some spiritual beings actually have come from the spiritual realm onto earth and are taking um, women, um, earthly women, uh, and that's kind of part of the cosmic rebellion against God. Now, there's two responses here. One is skepticism. Uh, and one is fascination. Um, on the skepticism side, you think, no, that can't be true. That just can't be true. 
But as Hamlet says to Horatio in the, in the play Hamlet, he says, Horatio, there's more things on heaven and earth than in your imagination. Now, I just want to assert that. Think about it. How, if we're ready to say there is no spiritual realm, how do we know that? See, that would mean that you would actually have to have access to all knowledge or that you have to be so confident that human ability to perceive the spiritual realm works. You know, like, just like if you've got an instrument to measure electricity. Um, if it measures electricity, that's fine. But if you want to measure spirituality, you need the right kind of tool. So if we're quick to say there is no spiritual realm outside what we can see, how, how do you know? Now, let me just give you one example. Most of us believe in atoms, uh, as in, you know, the small uh, microscopic or well, not microscopic. We can't even, you can't even see them with a the microscope, can you? So we believe, in, we believe in atoms, these things that hold the fabric of the universe together. Have you ever seen one? I've never seen one. And yet, we believe they exist. Well, two things. Why? Because there's the right kind of equipment. But I don't know how to use the equipment. So why do I believe they exist? Well, actually, I have to trust the authority of the people that tell me. We're actually in the same position when it comes to the spiritual realm. Um, if, we, if we're not sure whether we can see it or not, but maybe there are people who can see it. Maybe God has revealed himself in it. So that, let me just, I'm glad if you're skeptical, but um, skepticism, true skepticism, actually has an open mind and are, is prepared to ask questions to think, do I know everything? Um, not just say, it can't be true because I, what? How do you know it can't be true? But the other part of this is fascination. Um, if you get online and type in um, Nephilim, um, there's just reams and reams and reams of rubbish. <laughs> Um, written on the web, um, all based on one sentence. Actually, there's a couple other references to the Nephilim in the rest of the Old Testament, and they don't really tell you anything. Um, so the other thing is it can be a stupid obsession. Um, the reformers in the 15th and 16th century had a rough rule of thumb um, when you came to read the Bible. The Bible's really clear in lots and lots and lots of places. Um, use what's clear to look at what's not clear uh, and work out the priority waiting there. Don't be obsessed with the stuff that's unclear and obscure and let that be a preoccupation. All right, let's move on though. The disaster here is not so much just the cosmic rebellion, it's the human heart. Look at sentence five. The Lord, that is God the creator, saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is a shocking statement. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now it's interesting, um, he, the humanity there might not have always acted on their evilness. Perhaps they were still restrained a little bit by rules or culture or by what their peers might have they thought of, but their heart, their intention, if they could have gotten away with it, was evil all the time. It's saying every, it's not partially good and evil, it's not this mingling, but all the time. Now, that's a staggering idea. And we think, no, surely that's not a description of humanity now. Well, oh, sorry, didn't mention this. This is the next series uh, coming up after Easter. Just newsflash, next series. Um, I forgot this was here. This is a quote from Sigmund Freud, um, this old man in a beard. Uh, Sex is the preoccupation of all human beings. And that's what we'll be exploring um, after Easter. Chemistry, biology, psychology, and love. Right, moving on to this quote. Um, this is from, the, um, this quote is about the Aztec culture. Right down in Sydney at the moment, there's an exhibition from the Aztec culture, which is in Mexico. Um, it's a culture that's only, our, our knowledge of it is, is really only 500 years old. So this is like what the culture was like just 500 years ago in Mexico City. And this is a quote from a person reviewing that exhibition down in Sydney um, from a newspaper. It talks about these two gods, uh, the gods of uh, Tlaloc, the god of rain fertility, and I don't know how to pronounce the second name of the god, the god of war. Hoitzilopochtli. Um, Let's go with that, right? He said, uh, the great temple in the capital, which is today Mexico City, was dedicated to these two gods. And this is what he says. Each of these divinity, divinities required a constant stream of human sacrifices, which could range from young girls to captured warriors. Indeed, the principal object of war, apart from territorial expansion, was to capture prisoners for sacrifice. The sacrifices were stretched over the altar, 
the priest slit open their stomach, reached into the cavity and tore out the victim's heart. And the body was thrown down the steps to be later eaten by the priests. The Aztecs, uh, why did they expand? Why did they conquer other people? To, to kill them. Awful, horrendous culture filled with violence and bloodshed. It said every day a victim had to be offered to that God. And the culture celebrated uh, fertility and death. And this reviewer goes on to say what's interesting uh, in that culture, um, in, their, in their poetry and in the documents we have, um, there is no celebration of joy whatsoever. And it's a culture that existed um, until 500 years ago, until the Spanish conquistadors came in and um, uh, through their war and also through, through disease, destroyed the culture. See, what is humanity like? Now you think, well, that's, but that's a different culture. Well, uh, a few years ago, I was walking through the National Gallery uh, in Canberra and you see Sidney Nolan and, you know, the Sidney Nolan, the, uh, the, I was going to say Fred Kelly, that's not right. Ned Kelly, close. And you get the black picture of the box and the slit and the horse and he's got all those amazing Sidney Nolan pictures. And then I came around a corner to these um, pictures by uh, an artist called Albert Tucker. And he was painting um, in Melbourne after, well, during World War II and after World War II. And I came across this picture, which I've never forgotten. It's called Victory Girls. And he, he's saying, yes, what's happened over in Europe with World War II is awful, horrendous. But he's saying, look what's happening in our own city in the midst of war. At, um, the two, two soldiers here. Um, uh, pictured as pigs um, uh, and two girls, two women, um, uh, offering themselves as the spoils of victory to an American and an Australian soldier. And um, the colours there of, of the empire and um, their kind of trap-like mouths. Um, it's kind of an ironic title. And he saw the way evil was happening over in Europe in World War II, but he was seeing the kind of way in which even the society that he lived in Melbourne had given itself over to evil and um, painted this picture that I've ne never forgotten. I kind of, that was it for me. I don't remember anything else in walking through that exhibition. See, there is profound and staggering evil in humanity. It's shocking. It's hard to deal with. Um, a bloke called Aristotle, old dead white guy, um, he, he tried to help us think, what is humanity like? Um, he was trying to explore what uh, humanity looked like. He said there's two ways to think about the human nature. Uh, first one is incontinence. Um, that sounds terrible. Uh, what it means is unable to control. And he says humanity, um, what are they like? They're either incontinent or intemperate. Um, he said the mind is so deprived of knowledge that it cannot mark the evil in its own misdeeds, but it can generally discern evil when others do it. So he's saying we can look at other people and see the wrong they do, but when it comes to our examination of our own lives and our own hearts, we, we can't see it. But then he says there's also intemperance. He says there's an awareness of wrongness in some people or in some areas of our lives. In it anyway. Um, my, I, I've just realised, you know, the mechanic that I just recently saw um, just, you know, rips me off. I probably I needed to pay for half the work I've done. Now, has that happened to anyone else, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Any specialised person who's got some kind of knowledge you don't have, it seems like they'll take advantage of it to... Well, if humanity is so good, why does that happen so consistently? See, the Bible here is painting a picture of a disaster in the human heart. But have a look at the contrast here. Have a look at the contrast here. Sentence 5. It says, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and the every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sentence six, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. See, it's actually because God, the creator, cares so much about goodness, cares so much about justice, cares so much about mercy. Uh, might you want to pour that poor gentleman a glass of water? Um, because God cares so much 
He, the language there is he's, he's grieved in his heart. There's a contrast to two hearts. Humanity's heart, their only intention all the time is given over. Whereas God's heart, when he sees evil and wickedness unfold, he's, he's grieved by it. See, God, God's judgment here in this flood isn't arbitrary. It's not abstract. It's actually because wickedness and evil profoundly matter to him and he must do something about it. I've said this before, but I think it's really worth seeing the weight of this. Put yourself in that position. If you were walking down the street and you saw someone hurting someone else and you had the power to end it or to intervene to protect that person and you didn't wield that power, what would that say about you? That you just didn't care that someone else was being hurt or beaten up. That you just stood aloof to it, washed your hands of it. See, but if you care, you'd intervene, wouldn't you? If you had the power in some way, if you cared about people at all, wouldn't you try and end that evil? So what does God do because of his heart? Well, see, if he lets it go on, more, e- more evil and more evil and more evil will happen. And so God, because of his goodness, ends it. And what happens, and we don't have time to read it, but the flood is actually a story of uncreation. So in the story of creation in Genesis 1, um, the waters were held back, dry land appears, um, then there's water creatures, and then there's animal creatures, and then the kind of order of creation is given. In the flood account, uh, in chapter 7, of you, uh, it's actually almost exactly the reverse order. So it's a story of uncreation. Humanity has so corrupted the earth by its violence, broken the world it lives in, that God uses the world to judge humanity, to wash it clean, as it were. And, it, and the order is the flood waters come, the dry land disappears, um, then the, the way in which the animals are described as going is the order of creation. And then it ends with everything with the breath of life died, which is the, the same way the order of creation is given everything with the breath of life, you know, is given. So it's, it's a direct contrast. But the surprise in this, the surprise in this, if we take sin and evil and brokenness seriously, is not the judgment of God. It's the mercy of God. That is the surprise, if this is a true picture of humanity. Look at, look at uh, chapter 6 there, verse 8. It says, But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. Now it's interesting, you could find favour because you're looking for it. You know, you're actually trying to please someone. But the way this is used is almost like um, you're going for a walk in the forest and you find a stream. You weren't looking for the stream, it just, it found you as it were. You just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, So Noah finds favour in the eyes of the Lord. God looks on him with favour. It's from God. And what's the word favour? In the Old Testament, it's the word grace. God looks on Noah with undeserved generosity. He didn't earn it. And what's this effect of God's generosity? Well, the next sentence. Noah, it says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Because of the favor that God showed to Noah, because of the surprise of his love in the midst of the disaster of the human heart, Noah's life has changed. But not just that, if you know the story, Noah is what? Saved. He listens to God, he builds an ark, and he's saved. But you notice in the story, well, you might not notice, but in the story, it's not just Noah who's saved. The surprise of God's love here is the surprise of love that he has for Noah's family. See, Noah finds favour, but what does that lead to? Look at sentence 18, uh, turn over to chapter 8, 18. Um, It says, at the end of the flood, so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him. And then sentence 19, every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. See, the surprise here is of God's love for one, his generosity towards one saves many. We don't, we find out later that some of Noah's family were, were not good. We're just evil. It's not because they were good. It's because of God's surprising love, his grace for one. But it's not just Noah and his families. 
Um, it's the creation. The beasts of the earth are saved. See, grace saves life, is what it's saying here. But have a look here, the surprise of God's love for us in sentences uh, 20 and 21. It is after the flood. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Never will I strike again down every living creature as I have done. When the earth remains, seed time is harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. That, that's amazing. See the description? Humanity's heart is what? Just like it was before the flood. <laughs> it hasn't changed. So God does what? Makes a promise. Covenant. You find out a little a, a, a legal contract. What contract involves two party pledging to humanity completely of his own initiative. to save many. It's been Um, evil may be in your workplace, neighborhood, or I mean, some family difficulty. Uh, the story um, that gets picked up in the New Testament is, and I'm trying to remember the reference, is that God knows how to rescue his people in the midst of evil. He knows how to protect them. So keep trusting him. Uh, it's saying that Noah was in the midst of a generation that had which was profoundly corrupt, and yet God rescued him. So if you are in the midst of a difficult heartache, keep entrusting yourself to God. Uh, he, he knows how to protect you and save you. All right, let me pause it there. Uh, we'll just ask, if everyone's happy, we might leave the, Scott, we might just leave the webcast on if no one's, the camera's not pointed at you, so um, if you're happy during question and answer time to leave the webcast on, everyone's happy. If anyone objects, we're happy to turn it off. No? All right, everyone's happy. I'll try to remember to not say your name, but don't worry, the camera's not pointing at you. Uh, it's just me in the limelight. All right, questions, comments, reflections, challenges? Um, this probably isn't a question along your main thing, but I, I've always read it that 
Noah was righteous first, and that's why God has favour with him. But you, which, which you know, does contrast with another passage in the Bible that says no one is righteous. So, but you know, you've taken more of that that angle that Noah was lucky. So was Noah yeah. righteous first? I mean, Noah yeah, was yeah. Lucky, but was he righteous first, or was he yeah. righteous because God enabled him to be righteous and effectively saved him? Yeah, I think he was righteous because God enabled him to be. The, the reason is the way it's ordered in the text. Um, but Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. So because that comes first, I've read that as having that implication that that's the way you're supposed to read what follows next. Um, yeah, you're actually supposed to not read the next sentence without the context that God had showed kindness to Noah and was at work in his life. Yeah, yeah. Which is a bit shocking for us, isn't it? <laughs> Consistent with the way of the New Testament. Yeah. Um, the way I might describe, thinking about the story of the flood, uh, if you think about how does God work, um, just because it's a memorable, gunshot wound, <laughs> GSW, um, grace is first. So notice the order. Um, grace is shown by God. That leads to salvation. And then worship follows afterwards because that's what Noah does when he gets out of the ark. He worships God. And so, yeah, it's grace leads to salvation, which leads to worship. Um, it's not, we worship God, therefore he saves us. It's not the other way around. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that's a great acronym, but it's fitting for this passage, gunshot wound. Um, yeah. Other questions or comments or challenges? <coughs> Yeah, uh, just got to remember to repeat things for the webcast. Uh, the question is, the style of Genesis compared to the New Testament is very different. In the New Testament, you know who the writers are. They declare themselves. Um, there's lots of first-person narrative. Here, it's um, a, a writer who seems to, uh, the narrator seems to have an overview of everything. The Lord saw, the Lord said. Um, yeah, later on, is it in Deuteronomy? It says that Moses um, wrote the first five books, they're called the books of Moses because Moses um, wrote them. It's not actually revealed how he, how he knew this information. Um, so it's not actually given to us. Um, we don't really know. And interestingly enough, even when the Bible says that Moses wrote the first um, five books of the Old Testament, does, there's some bits in that book that record Moses' death. So he clearly didn't write those bits. <laughs> so um, uh, it's used as a, as a kind of coverall statement um, as opposed to knowing that every every word or every phrase was actually written by Moses himself, yeah. So, yeah. Um, can I comment on that? I've heard a very compelling alternative view, which says Moses was the compiler um, of potentially different authors. Um, and if, if you look at and if you look at um, Genesis two, for example, where you, and you see this here again in Genesis. These are the generations of Noah. They almost serve as what uh, someone interpreted as bookends of one writer's work and then the next writer's work and then the next writer's work. And these happen about 11 times in Genesis with Moses then through some way of passing on compiled. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense to me because <clears throat> when you look at um, Genesis 1, where you look at the sequence of creation, and you see how God on day five created the birds out of the water. On day six, he created the animals out of the land, uh, out of the ground. And then he creates man. And then in Genesis 2, 4, you've got, and this is the generations of the heavens and the earth. Yep. Then it goes into Genesis 2, where God creates the garden for Adam. Yep. And then in that garden, he creates then the birds out of the ground and the uh, uh, animals out of the ground. And then after that, creates woman. Because uh, at that point, he's been creating the animals for Adam to name and find a helpmate. And if you didn't have this understanding, you would see that there's potentially a contradiction. So did God create the birds out of the water, as Genesis 1 says, or out of the ground, as Genesis 2 says? Uh, I'll go, I'll, say, I'll make a comment on that. So the, the kind of issue is, um, 
yeah, were there many writers of the part and then Moses worked as an editor, um, there's actually a famous theory called the documentary hypothesis, which uses the various names of God given in the Old Testament. So Elohim, uh, or his personal name, Yahweh, uh, El, El Shaddai, is that right? Um, and, and basically he tries to work out that different parts of the text were written by different people according to the names of the God that gets used. The problem is when you look at that um, really carefully, sometimes you have to split the narrative up as if the first half was written, then he accidentally used, then someone else wrote a sentence and used the different name of God at a different point. And then at another point, uh, it resumed uh, as if the writers weren't aware. Um, and so that hypothesis has kind of been overturned. There could, have been, there could have been writers of various components. We don't really know. But I, I wouldn't want to, I'd want to be careful to say that the narrator or the editor overall um, has a very clear purpose and, and brings it together very clearly. So the very fact that you've got the sentences, these are the generations, these are the generations, these are the generations, so accurately and consistently repeated shows you that the, whoever brought it together, brought it together as a single narrative um, to be read as one whole. So we've got to work with what we've ended up with. That's the, the best way to read it. And I think actually trying to dig back behind it just gets really messy. They try and do the same thing in the New Testament. Um, yeah, but more and more that idea that there's multiple authors of multiple parts is actually being overturned as people dig more into the text and show its incredible consistency um, that it just doesn't make sense that different authors, it's too consistent for that idea. Yeah. Yeah, other, other questions or comments? Yeah. What, what brought my mind in this thing um, is when you get the verse that God regretted all of this. Hmm. And you would think, I, I think of myself as potentially trying to do art or painting, and I go, oh, this rubbish, I'm going to scrap it up and throw it away. But I'm not omnipotent and I don't stand outside of time. But God, who is omnipotent and stands out of time, making a, that rubbish mistake, throws my mind in the skin, and I don't, I can't comprehend. Did he make the mistake on purpose? Did he do something to regret later on on purpose? Um, and I don't know if there's a satisfactory answer. But I'm happy to yeah, I think it's trying to capture... Um, I think it's trying to capture... Uh, and that's why the word grieved is used there, the strength of that word. I think it's trying to capture um, his, his real and true um, sadness at the state that humanity is is in and um, did did humanity did God want humanity to be wicked like that no that's why the word regret and grieved are important uh, he it was never his his goal or hope or desire that I can put it like that did he know that humanity could go this path and would go this path yes but is it what he wanted or pleased him no and I think that's what we need to hold on to here at the text um, does that make sense? It does, but it's not satisfactory. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to say it's not satisfactory. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. Um, I guess it, the, a little bit, it comes back to the quote of the, the end with Gandalf, um, Sister Frodo. He says, um, he's saying, can we in the story really see all ends? Uh, are we big enough to kind of see the ends of everything? And um, I guess that's part of the Bible's picture. It gives us a lot of information but it doesn't tell us everything um, and we stand inside the story. Yeah, which is a bit shocking and surprising to us and we'd like to, to be the narrators of the story personally. But I think this is part of the Bible, just um, God humbling himself and saying, yep, that's the decision I made. <laughs> it's hard to cope with, but um, if there is a creator, well, that's his call. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much this relates to all you guys. That's right. I've done it all. I've been really, really bad, and, and since I had had the Lord in my life and reading from the Bible and, wor and working through the Word and um, through the people that I know, my life has gotten so much better. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's living proof. Yeah. You know what I mean? Going from listening to Him and what what house He says for me to live, and is enough 
Yeah, okay. So you're, in some sense, you're saying, it's a helpful comment, you're saying you've actually experienced uh, what it was uh, because of the choices you've made, uh, a life of awfulness and difficulty and hardship evil. And, and evil. Yeah, evil. I didn't, want, I didn't want to use that word, but I'm glad for you to use it. Evil. Yeah, yeah. And then, but then as you've you listened to God and, and he's shown you grace and mercy and you've responded to what he said, that's transformed your life and you, in, a in a massive way. Yeah, I think that's... The magistrate give me mercy again this morning because I have been going really well. And, yeah. And I, I thank God for... And thank God for the salvos every day now, you know, yeah. and for people like him and you. Yeah. You know, that give me the incentive to keep going along with this because it makes so much sense the more and more I listen to it and more and more I study. Yeah. You know, I appreciate it. Here. Yeah, yeah. That's helpful. I think... And that's part of what I was pushing for in the talk is I think... If we haven't experienced deep and awful true, or not true evil, but we haven't experienced deep evil done upon us or maybe that we've done, it's really easy to look at this kind of account and think, it just, it just doesn't ring true. It's just kind of arbitrary. But um, I, I think you look around the world and also some of the things I've seen unfold even in, in my life and in the lives of people around me, I think, no, actually, this picture of the human heart, I think it's pretty accurate. Um, yeah, shocking as it is, staggering as it is, is actually accurate. And if we haven't experienced, then that's because God has been very kind to you. Uh, and I hope it doesn't come in your life, but sooner or later it probably will. Yeah. And why doesn't that passage mention, it talks about evil in the entire, why doesn't it talk about why evil is bad? Because it's, you know, Satan, Yeah, partly because it's, um, so the question is, why doesn't it talk about why evil is there? Um, uh, because it's expecting you to read the story of Genesis. We're, we're doing an artificial thing by me looking at time. Uh, you're actually supposed to look at the whole narrative together. And, it, and earlier in Genesis, it's established that issue of humanity has rejected God who gives life. And he's good. So when you reject him, uh, where do you end up? If he's, if he's good and he's light, you end up in darkness uh, and death sooner or later. It's just inevitable. It's kind of binary, unfortunately. Um, and so and I saw an engineer smile over there somewhere the word, used the word binary, slipped it in um, yeah so we're, what we're doing is a little bit artificial and I guess if you've kind of just stepped into the story it's worth going back and reading the preceding chapters um, but you know the Israelites when they used to read some of the Old Testament used to take the whole day to meet the whole read the whole thing all together um, but your employers might not like that so um, yeah yeah, other questions or comments? All right. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Feel like you can uh, stay and hang around and chat if you've got time. Um, but if you need to go, uh, by all means, uh, it was great to have you here.